What up, Slackers? I'm Matt. And I'm Jesse. We're the host of American Slacker, a weekly show that discusses the weirdest in world events. We cover UFC, the latest in technology, Xbox games, entertainment, and music reviews. We have conversations with musicians, actors, filmmakers, and other interesting guests. Twist one up or crack one open with us every Monday to start your work week off right. That's it. There you go. The existence of two pre-dug graves led investigators to ultimately conclude that they were originally intended for Alyssa's two younger twin brothers. She had a prominent online presence like many teens, including a YouTube account and Facebook and MySpace profiles. On her YouTube account, where she lists her hobbies as killing people and cutting, a video was posted showing Alyssa touching an electrified cattle fence, then encouraging her brothers to do the same. The existence of this and other videos, along with multiple photos showing her with exaggerated makeup, bloody cuts, and holding a bloody knife to a friend's throat did not help at all to convince authorities that she was anything less than a premeditated murderer. Although juvenile defense attorney Kurt Valentine tried valiantly to have the case tried in juvenile court, Alyssa was indicted on the first-degree murder and armed criminal action charges on November 18, 2009, ordered to stand trial as an adult. Prosecutors argued that no treatment program in the juvenile system was equipped to rehabilitate this offense or this child. Although Missouri possessed a nationally respected juvenile justice system, it was geared toward boys and unfortunately they were ill-equipped to house a violent juvenile female inmate properly. With Alyssa arraigned in adult court, juvenile defense attorney Kurt Valentine was dismissed as counsel. Alyssa was not present as she technically now lacked legal representation, therefore the judge entered a not guilty plea on her behalf. Just a few days later, on November 20th, Alyssa was ordered by the court to undergo up to 96 hours of psychological evaluation, after defense counsel reported that she was unwell in jail. She had exhibited signs of severe anxiety and depression and was on suicide watch after repeatedly scratching herself with her own fingernails. A status hearing on the case was originally scheduled for December 9, 2009. However, it was canceled and a rearrangement was added to the calendar for the next day. By now, she had legal representation and a not guilty plea was entered once again. Ahead of her impending March 2010 pretrial hearing, defense attorneys requested that Alyssa be allowed to wear her own clothing in court. They feared that allowing the jury to see her in a prison jumpsuit would give the jury an unfair perception of her guilt. The motion was denied. Being below the age of 16, the death penalty was off the table under state law. This case was to see several continuations and delays prior to its resolution. The summer of 2010 was spent debating whether Alyssa had the right to finish high school as a pretrial detainee. Cole County Circuit Court Judge Joyce turned down defense attorneys' continued requests and appeals that would have allowed Alyssa to participate in an online program. The issue would rise to the Missouri Supreme Court where it was thrown out in October, just a week shy of the one-year anniversary of the murder. The murder trial was scheduled to begin May 11, 2011, but it was delayed as Judge Joyce suppressed a portion of the confession Alyssa had given police. In late June, the judge ruled that officers utilized deceptive questioning tactics. Specifically, the juvenile officer present during the confession was found to have acted inappropriately and unprofessionally. The officer was reported to have attempted to extract a confession from Alyssa. The officer's purpose for being present was to observe the interview and protect the juvenile's rights, not to participate in the interrogation. Instead, the officer intentionally made Alyssa believe that she was present to act as her advocate and actively encouraged her to talk to investigators. Everything said after line 14, page 71 of the interrogation transcript was ruled inadmissible in Alyssa's adult criminal proceeding, 
as she was in the custody of juvenile services at its recording. Had the juvenile officer just observed, as was her job, the entire confession could have been used. But luckily for them, the prosecution still had a substantial piece of evidence in Alyssa's journal. Upon further inspection, other alarming passages were located, including one detailing how she wanted to burn down a house and murder whoever was trapped in it. Trial is moved to September 13th and then again postponed to after the first of the year because the prosecution needed more time to process the evidence. Many samples were minuscule and completely used up during the state's testing for DNA, leaving nothing for the defense to have tested. The judge ruled also that any future testing at least be done in the presence of a defense team representative. Once 2012 dawned, Alyssa withdrew her plea of not guilty, and on January 10, 2012, Alyssa accepted a plea deal. She pled guilty to second-degree murder and armed criminal action, waiving her right to a jury trial and subjecting herself to sentencing by the judge. The sentencing phase began on February 8th. Both sides had only this time to present evidence to the judge which supported each of their suggestions for length of sentence. Witnesses and experts testified, including Alyssa's father, who was incarcerated himself. The defense spent a good deal of time highlighting the fact that not only had Alyssa been on Prozac for the two years prior to the murder, but her dosage had been increased about two weeks before. Experts for the defense presented evidence and testimony regarding the potential effects of SSRI medications on the juvenile brain. They spoke of diagnoses of major depressive disorder along with some features of borderline personality disorder. They argued that her turbulent early upbringing, subsequent depression and suicide attempts, along with her age, made her more receptive to rehabilitation and therefore a sentence on the lower end of the spectrum. Prosecutor Mark Richardson took the opportunity to read incriminating entries aloud from Melissa's journal. In an effort to point out premeditation with cool reflection, a first-degree murder requirement, he went to the week before the murder when Alyssa's cell phone charger was broken. She had expressed distress at her inability to stay connected with her friends and that she felt alone. When he recited the passage, if I don't talk about it, I bottle it up, and when I explode, someone's going to die, Alyssa's grandmother abruptly exited the courtroom in tears. Judge Joyce appeared to accept the prosecutor's implications, sentencing Alyssa to what her public defenders deemed a harsh length of time, life without parole for the second-degree murder charge, and 30 years for the charge of armed criminal action. Under Missouri law, Alyssa will be eligible for parole around the age of 50 after serving the necessary 85% minimum of the life sentence plus one-third of the 30-year sentence with credit for the time she had already served. Alyssa addressed Elizabeth's family, apologized, and expressed her wish to trade places with her victim. She became emotional and left the courtroom. Elizabeth's mother said she was coached by her attorneys to apologize. They didn't believe anything she had to say and that she was less than human. D.A. Richardson said that the suppression of part of the confession facilitated the drafting of the plea deal. The statements required to argue for first-degree murder were no longer admissible in court. Not only that, but a plea would guarantee that a dangerous murderer would be off the streets with a sentence found fair and fit by an experienced judge. Enter in the fact that around this time back in 2012, the Supreme Court was rumored to be preparing to rule on whether life without the possibility of parole was unconstitutional for juveniles. Although D.A. Richardson noted that this had no bearing on the drafting of the plea, Alyssa Bustamante would reference the impending high court decision in January 2014 when she petitioned the courts for post-conviction relief. Her basis was that she took the plea deal due to a fear of spending the rest of her life incarcerated, stating that, had she known that the Supreme Court ruling appeared imminent, she would have opted for the first-degree murder trial and a sentence that could have been less than life. 
way for the jury to consider less time than life without parole, even if you were convicted of uh, first-degree murder, let's say? Would that have changed your thinking about pleading guilty? Absolutely. And first, why would it have changed? Basically, the main reason for accepting the offer was to avoid the absolute certainty of life without parole. If there was another option, then there would have been no reason to have accepted that offer. So if a jury finding you guilty of first-degree murder could consider sentencing you to life or 30 years or something else, but also sentence you to life without parole, you are saying you would have still gone to trial. Yes, I rather would have would have rather taken my chances with a jury trial. And taken your chances at ultimately getting a sentence of life without parole. Yes. And why is that? Hope for a lesser sentence. And you understand you did get a lesser sentence. Yes. She claimed that her counsel was ineffective and that she felt rushed into making the decision. One of her former public defenders testified that he discussed the inevitable high court decision with his client, advising her that she faced a good chance of being convicted at trial. Ultimately, Judge Joyce, the original judge who sentenced her, denied the request for a new trial, saying that her counsel was not found to be ineffective and that given the evidence, she also found the potential for a guilty verdict overwhelming. She called Alyssa's claims meritless. Elizabeth's father, who was in jail on drug charges at the time of her murder, was sentenced in federal court on October 31, 2010, He received a sentence of almost 20 years in federal prison for being a felon in possession of stolen firearms. In interviews, he had expressed anguish and regret at not being at home to protect his daughter and his family. Now the man who's made his own mistakes feels guilty about a crime committed by someone else. Do you have guilt that you weren't there? Yes, I have a lot of guilt. I I should have been there to protect her. Every father should be. On October 3rd, 2012, Elizabeth's mother, Patty Price, was awarded a $400,000 judgment in a wrongful death lawsuit against Alyssa's grandparents, her legal guardians. On October 18th, 2012, Elizabeth's mother filed a second wrongful death suit, this time against Pathways Behavioral Health Care, along with Alyssa herself. The mental health provider was accused of knowing Alyssa wanted to harm the neighbor, along with her violent predisposition, claiming they did not act on this information when they should have. Pathways Behavioral Health Care was successfully able to argue that laws barred them from releasing the kind of confidential patient information necessary to prove their care was appropriate. That suit was dismissed, but a new suit against Alyssa was filed on October 16, 2015. On July 24, 2017, Elizabeth's mom was awarded $5 million plus 9% interest a year until paid in full. Price became eligible to seize anything in Alyssa's prison accounts above $500. Any compensation provided Alyssa Bustamante in regards to the murder of Elizabeth Olton will become the property of her mother, Patricia Price. Following an open records request filed by a major news source, these details regarding evidence came to light. They were gathered from a transcript of a secret motion to suppress hearing held on August 23, 2011. The documents indicated that muddy shovels and dirty clothing were seized from Melissa's home when the FBI served its original warrant. Subsequent tests revealed that any blood found on these items belonged to Alyssa. Information regarding suspicions against Alyssa's then-boyfriend were also revealed. Apparently, the day following the murder, Alyssa was at his house when she was supposed to be at school. Documents reveal that the FBI and Highway Patrol interviewed him a staggering eight times over the week following the crime. 
The boyfriend stated that Alyssa had only casually mentioned a 